Okay, we are going to continue through our epic metaphysical journey through the periphysium of Eurigena in the work of, interpreted by the work of Diedrich Karabain. And we have seen the connection between the Trinity and the Word, and we are going one level down into the primordial causes and participation. We're going to first give you a hint as to what are the primordial causes and how Eurigena understands them. The first principal ones, the first main ones, will be goodness through itself, being through itself and life through itself. We have also eternity, magnitude, peace, love, omnipotence, unity, perfection, and all the powers and reasons made by the Father in the Word. So all the powers, all the potentials and reasons made by the Father in the Word. After these come reason, intellect, wisdom, power, blessedness, justice and truth. But what are they? What are the primordial causes? They are ideas or predestinations of all things in the mind of God made in the world. Predestinations here doesn't mean that destiny is fixed, but that these primordial causes they have are harmonious, completely full and perfect structure. Okay, so Eurigena, by the way, is actually a proponent of free will. So it doesn't mean that you are predestined, according to Eurigena. Okay, so the primordial causes are the species of forms in which the reasons are created before the things themselves existed. What do we mean by participation? In the primordial causes, participation means that co-eternal, that they are co-eternal with God and with the beginning in which they are and which they were made. This idea is taken from the pseudo Dionysius, which was a very important early medieval Christian Neoplatonic philosopher. Unity between the causes and between the causes and their effects through the image of a circle. So we're going to try to explain this concept of the unity of the causes and the effects through the image of a circle. That's actually quite clarifying. Sometimes an image is much better than a logical explanation. For example, let's think about time. So what is the time in the center of a clock? Well, time in the center of a clock is nothing. It doesn't exist. However, you cannot think of time without the center of the clock. The center of the clock is the place from which everything moves in terms of time. And the only way for you to access time is if the center is there. The same. The all the hours will be contained in the center of the clock the same way everything in reality is structured according to the center of being which will be the world and the diversity of created effects manifests from there this is a very beautiful very simple image that is very clarifying causes therefore both remain in the world and move outward into created effects. A question arises though. Primordial causes. Were they nothing in the world before anything was? Or were they always in the world? Do they form an intrinsic part of the world? And Eurigen is going to give us also in a circular fashion an answer. They will be simultaneous with it, but not co-essential with God. Simultaneous with God, but not co-essential with God. Eurigena refuses a heretical idea. And that idea was that nothing existed co-eternally with God. But because nothing can exist 
together with God. God is actually that very nothingness from which all things were made. Remember, nothingness here is in the superlative sense, in the same way that the center of the clock only within the existence of that center is possible to get to the world of time and get to know time. Without the center, we wouldn't have that particular quality. Okay? Causes, causes are always as causes in the world potentially. At the same time, they were not always because they flowed through generation into forms, species, places, and time. So as you can see, the primordial causes are sort of the unifying powers and reasons that connect the center, the word, with the manifested universe, both material and intellectual as well. They always were, and they began to be. They are co-eternal with God, they always subsist in God. This is very important. They have no beginning. However, they are not co-eternal with God because they receive their beginning from the uncreated creator in the world. Okay, so this whole separation of these principles with God himself and the world and the Trinity, we have to never forget that they are, they are from the same center of the clock yeah this is the best image that you can have in order to understand these concepts okay you are aware that you live in time that time exists and that is something that is precise that you can measure or that you have a very strong sense even if subjective or objective so time is a fact of life however where does time where does time stem from the concept of time itself the primordial cause of time it comes from the center of that clock. And in the center of that clock, which is the, from which all time stems and all time can be measured, there is actually no time there. However, in order to have time, you must have that center. Okay? So this is a very powerful image to understand these concepts which are necessary. We're going to go to now slide number two of this presentation and let's go there. So we have the role. What is the role of the primordial causes? Eurigena is going to base this whole argumentation into Genesis 1 and this is going to be very interesting. You're going to see that it's not what what most people would interpret the six days of the the first six days of creation to be okay in the beginning in the word causes of the whole creature were made perfectly and immutable they turned toward the word of the father so causes are eternally formed in the word always contemplate the word which is above them. So once these primordial causes are created, they are always facing the world itself, meaning that there is no discontinuation. It's not that God clicks his fingers and then he goes away and lets the world be moving by itself. Yeah? It's the, there must be a constant participation because in that center, we have the core of everything. That center doesn't disappear and doesn't stop to participate. It's always the engine by which the hands of the clock are moving. Okay? The clock is just a metaphor. Yeah? So, what does this mean? They, they are held in being eternally by the world. So, we live in eternity and the world that we live in is therefore also sacred and holy. Okay, then we have also that things that the primordial causes create are constantly drawn up towards them in order to seek the cause. Okay, so the causes, the effects in which we live, they always stand to the cause. There is a natural attraction towards the cause of the creation. 
is like the cycle, the natural cycle of a river. It starts in a certain point in the mountain, trickles down, and then through more mysterious ways, through evaporation that is not so material, comes back to the source. And that attraction, that movement is always there. Therefore, all those movements of the soul, justice, compassion, thirst for truth, love, family, all these things of the world which are so fundamental, they're based on this truth. Natural compulsion is inherent in the very structure of all created effects. That's exactly what I just said. On the first day of creation, the waste and void over the abyss. What does this mean for Irigina? The perfection of the primordial nature created before all things in the world, which trickles down into their eternal aspect, are still a dark abyss. So that means that those primordial causes before the manifestation of the spiritual manifest into the world in which we live in, before that, they are still in the dark abyss. Yeah? So this dark abyss is holy. One phrase comes from Nietzsche who said, be careful when you look into the abyss because it might respond, well, what is the problem with that? That abyss is holy. Yeah, you're looking into the face of God himself. Okay? So the ineffable ex ex excellence in their purity and their infinite mysterious diffusion through all things. There certainly exists a mystery between that center that I described in the clock and the whole of the manifestation of time that depends on the center of that clock that has no time, but without which no time would move or exist, yeah, in this case to be measured, yeah, in the metaphor of the clock. But this applies to the whole of creation. In order to be able to abstract as to what are we talking about here, because we're always talking about things that we cannot see, or even think about with precision. Yeah? So causes of all things manifest in the brightness of the appearance of God. They still remain dark because they cannot be perceived by any other intellect except their cause. The effects show that they are, but not what they are and this applies to everything applies to creation applies to god applies to you you cannot possibly tell me exactly what you are i bet you to try and you will come up with very superficial definitions about what is it that you are however one thing you can for sure tell is that you exist that you are this is immensely important for spiritual practical work. The diffusion of causes brings the effect through the activity of the spirit. The spirit is the one that is responsible for the diffusion of the causes into multiplicity in an eternal activity of ordering and harmonization. Is this thing that I was talking in the previous video. This is very important. Just because we get into a realm that cannot be explained, where you see the limits of our understanding, and the more we delve into it, the more of an abyss seems to be. This is not a proof that we have to disregard metaphysics, disregard ultimate cause, disregard um, divinity, disregard God himself. It's the opposite. And from that, that's from... That's the place from which we are going to be able to understand nature, to understand ourselves, to understand morality, to understand how to live in the world. Okay? So thus the Trinity, unknowable to every creature, descends to become known and present to every intellect. So it is through, it's like this is Paul, um, Paul 120, I think it is. Um, I'll correct myself later if it's not correct. The, it's, 
it will be through the workings of creation that you have access in the meditation of to the ultimate sacrality of life yeah and creation and the ultimate cause for creation which is god of course the spirit eternally ferments and fertilizes the causes in the spirit's self it precedes the mystical waters understood as the primordial causes of genesis dividing light in from darkness god separated the knowledge of effects from the obscurity of their causes which are hidden and un and united in the word okay you can stop the video and also read okay here we have yes it was romans romans 120 which is the whole basis for the starting of argumentation of the periphysion is the from yeah so Regina says all creation is holy not simply because it was created by god in the world but because it was created from god all things made in god are god doesn't mean that you are god is that all things are god this this is a concept that's very difficult to formulate and yet it there's no way around it from the creation of the world his invisible things are seen being understood from the things that have been made this is the this is actually some paul romans 1 20. there's a bit of noise in the background please bear with me um let's go to the next slide here we have it again so then the four elements of the world created through the primordial causes are intermediate are in an intermediate position between the causes themselves and the composite bodies and they subsist in their causes this is very interesting i mean we, we can talk about this from the modern perspective the four elements of the world but we can also talk about chemistry the elements of the world and it's very interesting that the, the at the core of those elements there are numbers yeah uh, there is a particular number that applies to the incredible variety of matter that we have and the, the incredible possibilities of combinations from that and they all stem from basic number of protons and neutrons in this case of the numbers in the table of um, of the elements yeah so elements are subject to divine laws they are more primordial so numbers are more primordial than the elements themselves where do they stem from then if number is that important for chemistry we could argue that numbers actually are the primordial uh, sustaining conceptual path to from which all chemistry manifests and thus our mind is through those primordial principles through those numbers or more primordial principles shall we say because the primordial principles would be even before the numbers themselves yeah but if we think in these terms in, in from from things that we can that we can attain in our mind then it would be fair to say that numbers are at the core at the basis and then from them it's nature that arises in in, in all its variety in, in matter and uh, and also in life yeah so mystery we have always at the core the mister which is not a way of avoiding difficulties this is very important actually we are getting into the whole trouble of getting into the mystery and trying to understand it even if we have to recognize that the mystery uh, will remain as such yeah but there are indicators that mystery governs the heart of created and uncreated reality the mystery of being of life and of consciousness is unfathomable no mind not even the mind of the deity can fully comprehend these mysteries how can anyone attempt to explain the first downrush simultaneously into the initial constitution of this world which 
occurred in the blink of an eye. This is from the Periphysium itself in book number three, which occurred in the blink of an eye. So the six first days of creation for Erigena happened in the blink of an eye. This will not be a big bang. The big bang has a very materialistic underpinning thinking behind it. But conceptually, as how to think of all nature in metaphysical terms, Erigena arrives to the conclusion that this is not about day one, day two, as we understand days to be, not even epochs, as some people have suggested, but in the blink of an eye, meaning instantly. So the process that is explained in Genesis on the first six days of creation is a metaphysical concept that has an eternal quality behind it. So the six days of creation was a single instantaneous act, not divided by intervals of time. A very interesting interpretation indeed. So, but despite the mysterious origins, reason and observation can deduce that from nothing God called all things into essence in a fivefold motion of creation through the primordial causes in the Word. So, that fivefold motion is here expressed in this way the natural bodies, rocks, mountains, and other inanimate effects which are called simply to subsist. Trees and plants are called to subsist and to live. Animals also have sense in addition to subsisting and living. And number four, in human beings, reason is added to all these three. And in number five, we have the angelic nature which, to which the intellect is added. We have also a tripartite version of this division, which will be all created nature consists of the Holy Spirit, reasons, the holy body, physical realities, and the intermediate, both body and spirit. Okay, so created reality then is harmoniously knit together in the secret and ineffable unity of the world. This is absolutely essential. We have a unity here from which we can think about, no matter how mysterious it is, it trickles down to logical conclusions, to rational conclusions from in our re, uh, created reality. And we see it all over the place and a lot has to be invested in order for all of that to become relativistic in our minds, I have to say. The whole of creation, ordered from the highest to the lowest. As it progresses downward, the divine nature becomes more visible as God is made in God's effect. So we have here again the image of the clock from the center spiraling out. We have that despite everything that we've been saying here. However, we are, remember we are using the apophatic method, we have to counteract what we're saying with an equally valid statement that is paradoxical, but it works like a, like a magnet. Yeah, at its, at, at, at its center, it has unity, the same way that as its center, we have unity, despite the fact that we cannot see the time in the center. Okay, so yet we have to say, a hierarchical intelligible order is not an accurate account of how Eurigena envisages the creative process of the Triune God. So it's more, let me see, a hierarchical intelligible order is not an accurate account. So the hierarchy itself is not accurate, although he uses it in order to have a precise um, vision of the creative process that it's explained by the triune of God in Eurigena's work. So, we have the diffusion of the primordial crosses, forces through the spirit. Okay. The descent downward has two important components. One is gift and the other one is grace. 
The quote here is from James 1.17. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Give, datum in Latin, is the initial constitution of all things in being, and grace, donum in Latin, represents the virtues by which nature is adorned. Being and well-being then constitute the foundations of reality. How about that? As they descend from the causes to the lowest order of creation, that means that they are the only causes to do so. Wisdom, intellect and reason do not. So those well-being and being itself and well-being constitute the foundations of reality. Can you imagine that? Being descendants as the gift of God, as that by which every nature subsists, through the grace of God, well-being is that by which every subsisting creature is adorned. Goodness bestows not only the gift of being, and the grace of well-being, but also, as I will show, the gift of eternal being. Let's go to the next slide. I, I can't tell you how excited I get when I, when I read this thing. I, I swear I was exhausted when I started. And I'm... Okay, here we go. Slide number four. The creative activity does not end with the simple giving of gift or grace. We have seen about gift and grace in the previous slide. And now he's saying, I'll read it again. Creative activity does not end with the simple giving of gift and grace. Created natures continuously sustained in being. God's creative activity can be understood only in the context of of participation so it doesn't end with just gift and grace there is a constant eternal participation of the primar primordial causes into creation itself god is made in all things for he is held to be made in his creatures generally because in them he without whom they cannot be is not only understood to be but also in their essence. Participation explains how the causes relate to their created effects. What is good is good through participation in the good through itself, which is, this is how we start and we're now delucidating what this good through itself actually means or the place that it has in this whole system of thought. For it is by participation in the supreme good and the supreme goodness whose image it is, that the image is both goodness and good. Participation means to exist in God, in grace. Participation of effects in the cause means the cause is nothing else but the essence of all things. For only he truly exists by himself. Doesn't mean that you don't exist. It's that only he truly exists by himself. And he alone is everything which in the things that are is truly said to be. So the core of your existence. I mean, just read this again. Yet, however, we always have the counterpart. God is not a genus of the creature. Yeah, God remains more than the creature. Creature is not a species of God. Nonetheless, God can be said to be the genus and the whole, and the whole species and part since everything comes from God and can therefore be said of God. Yeah? Okay, let's go here to this isolated statement about the return. Yeah, so we have a whole, a whole cosmology here of being. In the return, 
all things find rest in the source, while paradoxically in the outgoing from their source things do not leave it, for they exist through participation in the nature that truly exists. Brilliant. Next one. Number five and last one. Here we have this procession. The creator is the unparticipated and is participated in. Okay? So this is the structure based on the uh, structure of nature, the division of nature that Eurigena does in the Periphysium in regards to this concept of participation. The Creator is the unparticipated and is participated in. The primordial causes are participated in and also participate in their cause. And the effects of the primordial causes participate in their causes. This is so beautiful actually if you think about it. It's giving you a full round and at the center, what's at the center? Because which one of the four divisions of nature is missing here? Is the uncreated, uncreating. So this is the articulation of the first three divisions of nature, as I said. So then participation is distribution of divine gifts and graces, the distribution of being and well-being from the highest to the lowest order in creation. We can also get the Greek terms here and uh, the very beautiful metaphor in order to understand all these concepts of the river. The river wells up from its source and continues to flow to its end. In the same way, the primordial causes flow down through the various orders of the universe from the higher to the lower. The primordial causes return back again to their source through the most secret channels of nature by a hidden course. Okay? Uh, this is interesting. Probably in the 9th century, maybe they didn't know that, you know, it's evaporation and then from the rain. Well, they probably did. It doesn't make sense that they wouldn't. Fundamental interconnectedness between the various... So we have here for the, our modern times a fundamental interconnectedness that we need to connect with today, okay? So this is all Neoplatonic. Eurigena is a Neoplatonic thinker. He explains that every order participates in the order above it and in turn is participated in by the order below it. The creator of all things has constituted between the participations of the natural orders marvelous and ineffable harmonies by which all things come together into one concord. Beautiful. Thank you very much. See you in the next one.